What's up everyone? Brent here and it is a beautiful day in California. This is literally one of the first kind of clear days we've had in about a month. There's been fires here for the last like three weeks, four weeks, something like that. Some of the biggest fires in California's history. So it's been like black skies. So it's very nice that it is clear out today. I'm very excited to be able to start filming again. Um, and today I am showing you guys the Predator electric bike from a company called Civi Bikes. It's a fat tire bike, weighs about 62 pounds, good entry level bike for $13.99. But before I dive into this bike here, I do want to talk a little bit about the company itself, Civi Bikes. Uh, this is the first time that I have actually worked with this company. Um, and like a lot of the companies that I work with, um, as opposed to Court, you know, I typically work with direct order only companies. And right now, Civi Bikes is a direct order only company. However, they are aiming to expand to about 50 retailers here, I think by the next quarter. Um, of course, that's just a projection. They don't have those yet. So I do want to talk about, you know, just my experience with them so far, um, my experience with um, direct order only, some potential downfalls with that, and just to kind of have you guys be aware of everything that kind of surrounds um, the direct order only style of electric bikes, right? Um, so one of the biggest assets I think with direct order only is that the price point, right? The price point is going to be generally speaking quite a bit lower than if it was at um, a retailer. So again, this bike runs for $13.99 and you know, I think that's a pretty fair price for what this is. Like I said, it's an entry level kind of fat tire electric bike, has some decent components, 500 watt gear tub motor here in the back. Um, you know, they upgraded the derailleur here to an Altus instead of the entry level um, Shimano tourney that typically comes on bikes like this. We do have suspension up here in the front, so that's kind of cool. Uh, mechanical disc brakes front and back, right? So some decent stuff here. So the price, that's one of the biggest pros I think that comes along with direct order only. However, there are of course some potential cons or some potential pitfalls that can come along with this as well. So one of the biggest things that I have found is um, really just kind of a, a communication barrier that can happen with some of these companies. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to understand them. Sometimes it can be difficult to get questions answered. That was not really my case with City Bikes. These guys do speak um, pretty good English. They certainly speak much better English than I speak any other foreign language. So, you know, that's fantastic. Um, my dealings with them was were pretty easy. They answered the phone promptly. They responded to my emails promptly and I was able to get my questions answered for the most part. So uh, I would say, you know, probably, you know, an A for that, right? So not bad. Uh, another potential issue though that can come along with direct order only is going to be the fit and finish of the bike because remember with direct order only I'm gonna to have to assemble all these bikes myself I have to put them together and the fit and finish can be an issue sometimes stuff just doesn't fit quite right the front wheel maybe doesn't fit um, or sometimes even the components don't really match what was advertised on the website again in the case of city bikes that was not the case everything fit together really easily um, and actually assembly was pretty swift it only took me about 15 minutes to get this bike you know up and running from the time that i cut open the box to the time that i was able to you know turn the thing on and get going which is not that bad at all typically it takes me anywhere from 15 minutes up to a couple hours to assemble these direct order only bikes just depending on the company depending on the level of difficulty to assemble and depending on the fit and finish but again with this bike that just wasn't an issue everything fit together nicely and it was really easy to assemble so yeah so again i always like to talk about that kind of stuff before i really dive into the bike just to give you you know just an kind of an overall comprehensive idea of, of what it is that we're working with here so now diving into the predator itself here I do want to start back here with this uh, this geared hub motor. This is a Bethang 500 watt geared hub motor in the back. Um, you know, 500 watts is, is pretty powerful. I've tested, you know, the 750 watt versions of these motors, 1000 watts, and the 500 watt, it does a pretty good job of getting this thing up to the top speed of 20 miles per hour. Uh, I, weigh about, I weigh about 185 pounds. I'm typically carrying that backpack over there that weighs around 30 pounds. And, you know, even if I was only using the throttle during the testing, it was able to get me up to 20 miles per hour, um, you know, on flat ground and even on slight hills. And if I was pedaling, I was able to get up to that speed, you know, pretty quickly. Um, one thing I do want to point out though about this motor or just the setup here with, with how it's set up in the rear wheel um, is sometimes what companies will do is they will actually increase the, the thickness, the gauge of the spokes here in the back to just give it more stability, more rigidity, more structural integrity um, compared to the thickness of the spokes in the front. Um, they did not do that here with City Bike. So these are both 13 gauge, this is 13 gauge spokes here in the rear wheel. And it's also 13 gauge spokes here in the front wheel. 
I don't really see that being a huge issue with this bike. Um, I mean, I think this is like an off-road bike, right? Uh, especially with the front suspension here. But like me personally, I'm not gonna be taking this thing over huge jumps. I'm just, you know, this thing fits really the paradigm of kind of trails like this, right? Where it's maybe some dirt stuff, maybe a little bit of bumpy stuff like that, but nothing like downhill, nothing like hardcore. Um, so I think that's gonna be okay. But I did just want to point that out, right? Because there's a couple of spots on this bike where, you know, they have to. Um, City Bikes has to to make some sacrifices in order to keep that price at $13.99 and just something small But I think you know these spokes here in the back. That's one of the areas where they did that with um, But since we're down here um, this rear cassette We've got a 13 to 28 spread here in the back and a 48 to, uh, 48 tooth chain ring here in the front Now something they, they did do is they actually upgraded the derailleur here from a Shimano Tourney Which is you know Shimano's uh, most entry-level derailleur uh, and they added a Shimano Altus instead. So that's a nice nice little upgrade point. A couple of things I do want to mention about this setup here in the back though with the derailleur and the power cable that goes right here is that there's no steel derailleur cage, which I often see on these kinds of bikes, especially ones that are geared more towards off-road. It looks like, you know, there's some bosses here where it could easily be installed if I wanted to, but again, there's just no stock steel derailleur cage and you know what those do those derailleur cages is they kind of come down come out and then down a little bit and they protect they help protect you know the derailleur um, and the power cable as well from strikes if i lay this bike over on the right this can get damaged without that derailleur guard um, potentially if i hit a curb or somehow hit a you know it's a log or something kind of going up like this without that derailleur guard it's probably going to be striking the um the derailleur here and possibly even the power cable so you know just something to keep keep in mind again like just going back to really the philosophy of use i think for this bike is going to be for moderate trails like this not not really hardcore stuff now these tires um these are i've really come to like the fat tire bikes they've definitely got a specific really paradigm a specific philosophy of use these are the four inch wide 26 inch tall fat tires these are big, they are heavy, and they do a great job of floating over soggy terrain. So if I wanted to take this through mud, if I wanted to take this through snow, through sand, I can air these tires down and it's going to, it's going to increase that tire patch even further. And it's just gonna give me a, a really big tire patch to float over that stuff where, you know, a normal bike with maybe two inch tires, 2.1, whatever, you know, they might sink into that kind of terrain. So that's one of the cool things about these fat tires. Um, they also, because they have such a big air volume, you know, they add some more suspension quality to this. This does have front suspension here, but it is a hard tail. So having these kind of big fat tires that, with that big air volume, it does help make the ride just a little bit more cushy in the back now these are um, i have not heard of this brand it's called chow yang um, typically when i see these fat tires it's from kendo that's kind of the entry level uh, fat tires that i see um, and normally the psi and those the kendos um, i think they are 30 up to, up to 30 psi this thing only goes up to 20 psi i don't remember where it is on the tire here but yeah max psi in this is going to be 20 and it doesn't even say what the minimum psi is Generally though, minimum PSI on these big fat tires is going to be five PSI. So we'll just say that that's what the minimum PSI is here. We'll just have an educated guess. Um, and you know, going back to the, just how we pump these tires up here really does make a difference with this bike and not only how it performs, but also just the range that I'm going to get out of it. Because again, with these big, big old tires, if I do air them down, it's going to make them so much more spongy. It's going to increase that tire patch, which is great for traction, but it also has more rolling resistance. So it's just going to slow the bike down overall. It's going to make the motor have to work harder. It's going to suck more energy out of the battery. So just, again, just some kind of stuff to keep in mind here. And also with these tires, another area where I think um, City Bikes tried to save a little bit, of, little bit of money is with the rims back here. So if you'll notice here on the rims, these are just double walled regular rims here, but um, if you guys have been watching some of these other fat tire reviews that we've done, you'll see that most of the time these are punched out. Um, and these rims are just solid, they're not punched out. And what happens is when we do, when these when companies do punch them out, those rims are just a little bit lighter and just helps shave down some of the weight for these big old fat tire bikes because these things do get heavy really quick. Again, this one weighs 62 pounds, which is a little bit lighter than some of the other fat tire electric bikes I've tested that weigh up to like 75 pounds even. So 62 pounds is not bad, uh, but that's an area where they, they could have saved some weight. But again, you know, I think Sippy Bikes really does have to make some conscious decisions of where they're going to kind of cut the price or, or to make, you know, to, to cut, cut some stuff to keep the price down. I think that's one of the areas where they did that here. 
So this is a double-sided plastic chain ring guard, um, I guess slash guide. So, you know, some cool things about this is, well, look, it's double-sided, right? So it's gonna help keep this chain lock into place. It's gonna help keep it from getting derailed towards the inside or towards the outside because it's gonna be blocking that, right, from, from jumping off. However, it is plastic, so if I do get a rock strike here, um, or really any sort of strike on the bottom um, of this chain ring guard, it's probably gonna crack this thing and it really is not gonna do a whole lot in the way of protecting the actual teeth of the chain ring. So just again, I mean, it really just goes back to, I think this philosophy of use of this bike, which is the, these kind of trails, right? Um, moderate off-road stuff, not really heavy duty off-road use, okay? Um, VP pedals here, just aluminum um, with these, uh, these pins in them, just standard pedals here. They're pretty nice and wide. They, they fit well for my feet, I have big feet. These are kind of big-ish pedal, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, 170 millimeter cranks here, uh, pro wheel cranks. Now, let's talk about these brakes really quick. So these are 180 millimeter mechanical disc brakes uh, in the front, and it's also a 180 millimeter disc here in the back. So I appreciate that these guys uh, put the put the same size discs front and back. Sometimes what I see is, you know, they'll put the, the bigger disc in the front and then they'll put like 160 in the back, which is fine. I mean, if people are going to pick one place to put, you know, a bigger disc, I would prefer for it to be in the front since this is where the majority of the stopping power comes from. Um, but again, these are mechanical brakes as opposed to hydraulic um, disc brakes here. And the, you know, some of the major differences really with that is just gonna be the stopping power overall. Um, and also, you know, the amount of pressure that I'm gonna have to put on the brake lever in order to actually stop this bike. So you'll see, you know, these on the mechanical disc brakes, generally the brake levers are these nice, big, long four finger brake levers. This one has a rubberized edge here on this side. So nice grip, easy to grip. However, if I do want to stop this bike fast, even for me, I have to really, really cinch down um, on this brake lever. So, you know, for folks who might have um, some hand issues or, or just smaller hands or maybe even really large hands, that could be an issue, especially since these brake levers are not adjustable like with hydraulic brake levers. So just some small points to keep in mind there with this. I, I didn't have a problem with it or anything, uh, but again, just really want to lay out every little <laughs> every little thing here that I can for you guys. Another thing to kind of keep in mind with mechanical brakes is sometimes over time the, the wire here can stretch. Um, it's generally a pretty easy fix if that happens. You know, I can just unscrew this little bolt right here, pull the wire down, um, make it more, make it taut again, sense it back up, and it should be good to go. Oh, we do have a quick release, by the way, here in the front, um, which is nice, so it makes it easy to get that front wheel off. The suspension here is Mozo spring suspension with about 125 millimeters of travel. There is preload adjust right here on the left, so I can turn this to the right if I want to increase the preload, and I can turn it to the left if I want to decrease the preload. This is kind of a nice little feature, especially for like me. Again, i kind of a heavier rider. I weigh like 185 pounds, and I typically am carrying a lot of gear, so being able to adjust um, the preload on, on this suspension or any suspension, it's just, it's just nice for me. Um, they also have a lockout on this side. It's not, a, it's not a compression clicker, it's just a lockout. So it's either open or if I close it like that, it's locked and that basically is gonna make these shocks dead. So it's gonna make them completely stiff. And you know, that actually could be cool if I want to conserve energy, if I don't want the shocks to be activated and, and really soaking up all my energy. That might be fine for a really flat trail like this, or if I want to take it through the city. I'm gonna go ahead and open this back up. Here on the arch of the suspension, there is a boss right here for like a fender. Um, maybe there could even be a way to mount a, uh, uh, like a front rack here. We could put a light right here if we wanted to. However, the Predator does not come with any of this stuff stock. And actually the company currently does not offer any really accessories to go with these bikes. So the good news is, is look, there is a boss right here for those accessories. There are bosses back here for um, a rear rack, for fenders. And again, there's even bosses for like, if I, want, if I do want to add a steel derailleur cage. So the bosses are there, but the components are not. So it doesn't come with any of that stuff. Again, just a reminder, if you guys do want to add that, or if I wanted to add that, I'd have to grab some aftermarket stuff. Um, and the only boss that really this thing doesn't have that I kind of wish it, it would is just um, bottle cage bosses. I think that there's probably room here to add them, but you know, a lot of these, this frame styles, they, they really don't, um, they don't add them for some reason. 
Speaking of the frame here, um, I do like this frame style, first of all. <clears throat> But this frame, um, this is the only frame size that City Bikes offers for the Predator. So it's only a 20 inch frame. And that's gonna be limiting for some folks because maybe extra tall or extra small riders, people like me who have like a 30 inch end seam, like maybe you might find this bike difficult to ride. And it's not gonna be an option to get a, a smaller frame or an option to get a larger frame. So really what you see is what you get here. There is also only three colors. We have this matte black color. There's a uh, pearl white and there's a matte platinum gray color as well. Um, the matte black, I, I personally always love these colors, but it is gonna be pretty low visibility at night. It's gonna be hard for people to see. Again, especially since not a lot comes with this bike as far as accessories go, so there's no rear light. There's no front light that comes with it. And with this color here, it's just, it's not gonna be that visible. So if you guys, <clears throat> like me, excuse me, if you guys like to ride, you know, in the evening at the sunset, it might be a good idea to consider snagging like either like a helmet with lights in it or some aftermarket lights, throw them on the handlebars, whatever, stuff like that. Um, just, just, to, just to stay safe. So going back up here to the handlebars real quick. So again, with these brake levers, um, one thing I really do like about this is it does have motor inhibitors built in. So whenever I depress the brake levers here, you'll see there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a uh, brake cable and there's a electrical cable. And that's basically going to shut off power to the motors whenever I barely depress these. And that's great. Um, that's great because number one, it's going to ensure that I have the shortest possible stopping distance. Because whenever I hit the brakes, no matter what's happening, if I still am pedaling, if I'm hitting the throttle, boom, power cuts to the motor and I'm only braking, not having the motor try to keep me going while I'm braking. And it's especially good for this bike that has a cadence sensor. Let's see if I can get a good shot of this here. So this has a cadence sensor. It's a 12 magnet cadence sensor. Um, it's internal. Let's see if we can see it. So it's an internal cadence sensor right here. Um, and there's, like most cadence sensors, there's going to be a little bit of a delay from the time I start pedaling to the time that I actually get power from the motor. And there's a delay from the time that I stop pedaling and the motor cuts power. And again, that's just one of the reasons why I like motor inhibitors is because I can, I can kind of manually control the motor output. And that's really, really helpful when I'm trying to navigate technical terrain at slow speeds because maybe the motor is detecting uh, movement in the cranks and it thinks I want to go, but really I just want to barely go. Uh, so I can shut the, shut the motor off real quick just by tapping the brakes. But I don't have to hit them all the way, right? I can just tap them, not squeeze them all the way to stop. Just barely barely tap them, and that's going to shut, shut off power to the motor. So good for safety, good for manual control as well. Really dig that. Over here on this side, let's talk about the battery real quick, and then we'll go over to the, uh, to the display here. Uh, so this is a 48 volt system here for the battery. It's a 13 amp hour battery, this one right here, and 624 watt hours. So fairly large battery, a little bit bigger than the, I guess, average capacity of about 500 watt hours. So that's kind of nice. I think that's important for a bike like this that has the fat tires because this thing really does suck up energy so much more than a standard uh, bike with standard tires of the standard width, you know? Um, what I do like about this as well is it does have a USB type A port. If I can open it with my no fingernails. It has a USB type A port on the top of the battery. This is a good location for this because if I do want to use the USB type A port while I'm riding to charge a, I can run the wire up here, up here to the handlebars, and I could charge or power like a um, an aftermarket light like we were talking about, um, or I could just, you know, charge my iPhone while I'm using that for navigation, whatever. I also like that it has a USB port because if I want to use this as a portable power bank while it's off the bike, because this is a locking, semi-integrated, removable battery, then that means I can do that. I can take this thing off the bike and I can charge it up. Also on the top of the battery here, there's a little power indicator, four bar power indicator, 25% increments. Not entirely precise, but a nice way to just kind of quickly check, hey, how much battery do I have left? On the other side of the battery, there is the, <laughs> the charging port. So the charging port is down here and that's not my favorite position for the charging port uh, simply because, ow, simply because if I'm charging this while the battery's on the bike, if I, if I forget, which trust me, I have forgotten and I accidentally move the cranks, it's possible for these cranks to interfere with the wire. It can pull on the wire. It can not just pull out and stop charging, but it can actually damage the port. It could damage the battery, maybe even make the bike inoperable. So another one of those just cautionary tales of if you are charging this, um, battery on the bike just be careful of of, uh, of the cord right here since it is on the bottom on the keyhole though thankfully is on the top 
So that makes it nice and easy to access out of the way of the cranks. And to take the battery out, it just requires a twist and a pull and it's really that easy. There's a battery right there. Like I was saying, 48 volt. Let's see if I can change this thing around. 48 volt, uh, 13 amp hour battery. And yeah, that's what it looks like. Put it back in is actually really cool. It's a small feature. Um, I don't even know if you call it a feature, but I'll take the keys out to show you here. To put this thing back in, I don't have to have the keys. I can just push and it just snaps back in, which I really like, especially for filming, because sometimes it's difficult to have to turn the key, uh, put the battery in. It just, it just makes it easier. It's a small thing, but I just really appreciate that. I like that a lot. All right, let's talk about the control center, the display up here. So the display and the button pad, they are integrated together. So it's one unit right here and it's kind of clean. Like I, I, it's a smaller one, um, but it makes the handlebars look uncluttered. So right off the bat, I do like that. Um, not a big fan of the separate bells right here. I prefer the bells that are kind of in the brake cluster, but still not, not bad at all. To turn this thing on, it just requires a long press of the M button. Boom, just like that. This thing powers to life. Whenever I turn this bike on, the throttle is going to be hot from zero miles per hour. So boom, turn that. You can see the bike just wiggles a little bit. So that's kind of cool. I, I like this for a couple of different reasons. Number one, if I'm at a crosswalk, if I want to cross the street immediately, if I'm at the bottom of a hill, I want to get started immediately, or if I'm trying to assist this bike up the stairs, which I do a lot, I can use the throttle to override the cadence sensor, which again, there's a delay, right? There's a del delay, especially at a higher gear. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a pretty big delay from the time that I start pedaling to the time that the motor actually starts spitting out power. So I like that the throttle is hot at zero miles per hour. However, again, another cautionary tale because this has happened to me is just, just be careful. Um, because it is live, if you're just resting on the bike, um, it, the throttle can easily be twisted. This thing can get away from you. Um, and if like it's not a busy intersection, maybe this tendency might be to like run after it and that could just, you know, it could be an issue. So just please be careful with that. Now over here, back to the display. Again, it's pretty small. This is a non-adjustable display. It does not angle, it does not pivot without tools. So if I want to try to reduce the glare, I just really can't do that. Um, I have not found an issue with being able to see this in direct sunlight. I mean, today is, is kind of overcast, so it's not really direct sunlight. So it's not a very good illustration for you guys, but uh, I took this out yesterday, did not have an issue at all. You can also adjust the brightness if you want to. Um, so once I have this thing activated, there's a five bar battery indicator on the top. So what is that? 20% increments again, more precise than the four bar battery indicator here on the battery itself. But you know, me personally, I always really prefer to have a percentage indicator just to have the most accurate feedback available for what's up here. Uh, on the right hand side, it's going to be starting and pedal assist level one every single time when I put, when I boot it up. So even if I go to level four, turn it off, if I turn it back on again, it's going to revert back to level one. Uh, here in the middle is going to be the current speed. Um, if I tap the M button, it's going to toggle through a couple different settings. I can have a tripometer, I can have an odometer, I can have the ride time, which is 10 seconds. Um, tap it again, it's going to go to average speed, tap it again, max speed, tap it again, go back to just the current speed that I'm riding at um, right now. However, if I do want to change some of the settings here, I can just hit the minus button and the plus button, hold those down. And that's gonna enter into the settings menu. So there's a couple of things back here, clear trip, set unit, set WD, set LS, and set voltage. If I wanna get deeper into the settings, I can hold the minus button and the plus button again. And that's going to get into the what, is, what they call specific settings. Uh, and there's a little bit more we can do down here. Uh, power setting, current set, assistant number, not sure what that is, speed sensor, slow start, backlight setting, password set. Um, so password set, that's kind of cool. If I do want to add a password here, I can do that on this. Also, if I hold the minus button, that's going to enter into walk mode. Boom, like that. <clears throat> if I hold the plus button, I think that's what changes the brightness here on the screen. Anything? It's kind of hard to see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I don't know if you saw that that change. I'm going to do it again for you guys. So I'm going to hold the plus button. Yeah, there we go. You can probably see that on, on screen one more time. So that's how you change the brightness or maybe it's just turning it on and off, but okay. Well, that's how you turn it on and off. It looks like the backlight is just by holding the, the plus button. Uh, maybe there's a way to wire a aftermarket light into this as well. Um, 
so you can use that to turn on the lights. Really, I'm not sure though. So, yeah, I think that is about it, guys, for this bike. Like I said, it's a cool, you know, entry-level bike, um, $13.99. Um, I think it's, you know, a fair deal. Of course, there are some, some a little bit of sacrifices to be made here. Uh, just some small stuff I was talking about, like just the, you know, the gauges, the gauge of the spokes here in the back, mechanical disc brakes instead of uh, hydraulic disc brakes, a plastic chain ring guard instead of a uh, aluminum one or a steel one, spring suspension, which isn't which isn't bad at all. Um, get the Shimano SIS index trigger shifter, kind of entry-level component. But again, entry-level bike, right? And for the price, I feel like it's a good starting platform because it provides the opportunity to add stuff on if I wanted to. I can add that rear rack. I can add fenders. I could put a steel derailleur guard on here. I could put a front fender. I could put a front light. And I could just kind of upgrade this thing as I get more money if I wanted to. Um, so again, one last time, I just want to touch on what I think is the paradigm philosophy of use really for this bike. And I think it's going to be that it's going to excel in kind of off-road terrain like this where it's just moderate not hardcore stuff no tabletops no downhill racing just some nice leisurely off-road stuff and i think out of the box it could also be ridden in the city because technically it is a class two the top speed of 20 miles per hour so it's going to be legal to ride in more places of course it's always good to check state and local laws to make sure it's legal to ride in your area because some places um, you know, you can't ride with the throttle here at all. Um, but as it stands, it could be ridden in the city, but again, with this color, low visibility, um, without the headlight or the taillight, low visibility. So just safety is always a concern for me when I'm riding around cars because I've been hit so far twice now by cars. Um, so I'm just always concerned about that, that kind of stuff. So without any further ado, let's take this thing out for a ride and see how it performs. So this is a chest mounted shot right here facing forward. And there's this little circuit that I have near my house. I like to ride around. So that's basically what I'm going to do a couple of times here for these videos to show you how this bike uh, performs in off-road in these kind of moderate off-road conditions. So I'm just going to do the circuit here with this uh, chest mounted shot and then those switch shots. This is literally the same exact path that I just took in the last shot, but this time the camera is facing forward just to give you guys kind of an idea of what this bike looks like in action and hopefully to give you a little bit better understanding of how it performs uh, going over this type of terrain. And then lastly, this is just to hear the motor starting and stopping when I start and stop pedaling. And I'll also 
we'll switch through the gears here so you guys can see the derailleur in action. And again, this is the Shimano Altus, which is one step up from the entry level Shimano Tourney derailleur. All right, guys, that is pretty much it for this review on the Predator from Civi Bikes. Thank you guys so much for watching. For the full write-up, head over to electricbikereview.com if you are going out to ride. Have fun and, of course, ride safe.